welcome back. Um, we decided to switch the, the, the sequence of the two lectures. So the next um, teacher, Andrew Myers, he isn't here yet today, so he's going to start tomorrow. Um, so you get a big dose of Alexandra and me today, but at least we'll switch off, so you hopefully you don't overdose too much. Okay. So uh, what I want to do on lecture two now, um, I want to move to uh, concurrency, or maybe um, maybe I'll call it communication. So uh, before I get to that, actually, there was a question about the end. What does completeness mean? Okay, in this setting. So the fact that we can eliminate cut means soundness of the of the of the system. Um, so we actually respect the meaning of the connectors on the right. So um, let me take as an example um, the width and the two rules for it. So let me remind you of that. Um, so the right rule is A proves B with C if A proves B and A proves C. And then we had two left rules, um, say B, C proves D if B proves D. Okay, and the other one, and now I'm going to put parentheses around that because I want to explore what happens when I don't have that rule. Okay, so maybe I forget to put that rule into the calculus. So it should be there somehow for completeness. If I don't have it, then the left rules are somehow very weak because even though a proof puts in um, proofs of B and C, with this rule I can only get B out, I can't get C out. It seems incomplete in some way, right? Okay, so what happens is that there are some things that I should be able to prove that I can now not, no longer prove because I made the system too weak. So can anybody think of an example of something I should be able to prove with this that I can't? Yeah? Commutativity of and. Okay, so let's try that. B with C proves C with B. Okay, so I could start here. I could extract B, but then I certainly can't prove B with C because I don't have C. So I'll start on the right. B with C proves C, and B with C proves uh, B. Okay, so now I have this rule, so this one here I can do. I can extract and get B proves B because that's the identity. Um, but here I can extract B. Uh, one, I can get B. I'm trying to prove C, and at this point I'm actually stuck. Okay? Yeah? Okay. Let's see if this is any better. Well, it seems, looks to be the same. Um, okay. Let's try blue. Okay. So, um, and if I believe that cut elimination still hold, I also know that I can't possibly be a proof now, okay? Because I always get stuck in this. And I didn't really have much choice. Other choices would also f uh, fail. This was the with red rule. Okay, so the test I want to apply um, to see that the system is complete in some way is to make sure that the meaning of the connectors as defined by the right rule is actually respected. And that would mean somewhere in a proof, I actually decompose the connective. Okay, so I actually decompose it. Um, and where could this be violated in a proof? Okay, so if you look at the rules that are still hypothetically on the board here, okay, you look at all the rules when you go from the premise to the conclusion, things don't disappear. They have a very strong property. Once they're there, they continue to be there, right? So that's a very strong property of these kind of logics that assumptions you have are going to persist and the conclusion is also still going to be there until you decompose it, okay? There's one rule which is an exception to this. Which rule is that? Well, it's not cut, 
Well, usually it's either cut or identity, right? This is the only things that, that's weird. So in cut, because it looks like this, A proves B and B proves C, we get A proves C. If you read it bottom up, A is still here and C is still there, so they're still there. But in identity, A proves A, and the identity holds for any proposition, so this is cut at B, and this is identity at A, you could actually stop and not decompose something when it's more complex, right? This could be some kind of conjunction, and you could use that here. So for example, you could just say somewhere, you know, well, A plus B proves A plus B by the identity, and we're done. But we haven't really decomposed that connective. So what we want to check is that we can restrict the use of the identity rule to only cases where we have to do it because we, get, we end up with a variable that we can't decompose further. Okay? So there's not variable, we want to be able to continue. So we want to restrict the identity rule only for variables, okay? nothing else. And if, if that check succeeds, then we say our system is complete because you can always extract enough information from the left-hand side to prove the right-hand side. So rather than here where we actually have um, commutativity, it's even a question of whether we can still prove the identity, okay, for a similar reason. Okay, so in our system, um, for example, if you want to prove that these rules here with the end left two being there is actually in balance would be like this. So somewhere you'd have A with B proves A with B, and that would be the identity at A with B. And you want to show you can replace it by another proof in which the identity rule is only applied to variables. So is that possible? Can we transform this into a proof in which the identity is only used at variables? Well, we should be able to prove that. You should be able to see that. How do we prove that if we don't use the identity here? Yeah, so we have A with B proves A with B. So we do with right, and then we get um, A with B proves A, and A with B proves B, okay? Okay, first with left rule, A proves A, and now it's okay to apply the identity here. And here we would use the second, we get B proves B, we use the identity on B. Okay, so there is some kind of a formal argument that you can make that for any proposition, no matter how complex, when you use the identity at that type, you can always reduce the identity just on variables. Okay, and we check that by doing it for each like separately. And then this is not an identity in, the, in this case, but it would be an appeal to the induction hypothesis. So if A is a complex proposition, we now apply the induction hypothesis and break that down all the way until we get to atomic propositions, which we can't break down, okay. But if you forget this rule, we will not be able to do that because this part of the proof here can't be carried out. So our rules without that one are incomplete, okay. So the two things together that in some kind of internal test without having some external semantics that you map things to, that these set of rules um, are sound and complete. Or we, the terminology for that in proof theory is to say that these rules are in harmony with each other, okay? So not just that the left rules are not too strong, which would violate cut elimination, and they're not too weak, which would violate um, this identity expansion property but they're exactly of the right strength and they fit exactly and you have a good logic, okay? So checking cut elimination by itself isn't quite enough. Um, you want to also check that you can do identity expansion, okay? Okay, the questions to that, yeah? Yeah. Well, because I take the right rules for the connective as my definition, I say I should be able to prove a conjunction if I can somehow use that rule in order to prove it. Um, 
This is my definition of what this actually means. It means A with B means that you can prove A, uh, B, and you can prove C. Uh, that's my definition. Okay, so I'm, I'm now wondering um, if the system is complete in, by this definition, if I should be able to prove every entailment that I can prove. And the point is I should be able to prove, for example, this one, okay? Um, if I have enough elimination rule that lets me extract information from the conjunction. But if I don't have it, then at some point I will get stuck and I have to use an identity and then the system is incomplete because I can't actually prove a with statement by using this rule, but I have to uh, refer back to a use of the identity. Okay. It's a little more subtle than a cut elimination, but it's, um, so cut elimination is a property of the way cut behaves. Um, and uh, so that's the soundness and the completeness property is a property of the way the identity behaves. Okay, other questions? Sorry, just, just to yep. on that. So you, the thing you specifically said was you should be able to prove like that commutativity statement. Yeah. I, I'm still not quite following when you should be able to prove something or not. Like, because if you had an independent notion of truth, we could say like, okay, it's, it's complete if for all things that are true, <coughs> right? But we don't have that notion of truth, so we can't appeal to that. So, but then you're, but we're appealing to some notion of that thing should be provable, and it's not clear to be what. It's the, if you think of this definition, as being the, the definition of what this conjunction means, then under that definition, we should be able to prove this, okay? If that's your definition, then we should be able to prove that because this definition of the right rule justifies both of these left rules, okay? Everything is still have cut elimination. And with both of those left rules, you can prove that, so this should be a valid consequence. If you admit that rule, you can no longer prove it, so you made a mistake somewhere your, rule, your left rules are too weak to reflect the full meaning of this conjunction. Okay. So should be able to prove is always with respect to when you kind of think of these things as being the right rules as being the definitions. Now, I can take another tack. I can also think as the left rules as my definitions. That would be the pragmatist point of view. And then I would have to see what happens to the right rules, whether I have enough of those. And I can ask the same question about whether the system is sound and complete internally. Okay. Um, okay. So this turns out to be not quite as important because from a programming perspective, it turns out that the identity expansion um, represents some kind of extensionality principle. Okay. So what it kind of says here, if if we forget about the context that we're in at the moment, is that a proof of the end right should be some kind of a pair of two proofs, okay? And what the identity expansion says that anything that it has type of a pair actually can be seen as being consistent of two things, okay? Um, so that is significant when you try to prove properties of programming languages, but um, it's not as significant as, um, as the absence of cut elimination, okay? Um, so, if you know something about if you know um, something about the theory of programming languages, there you have to prove these things called canonical form theorems for values when you do functional programming. And these canonical form theorems rely on the fact, for example, that a value of um, type A cross B actually is a pair, and that requires you to have some property of this nature. Okay, it's not really relevant for the rest of my lecture, but yeah. Just one more on the, on the thing. Yeah. Well, you can refer to symmetry, but um, that really works for this connective, but it doesn't work for something like implication and things like that. So you really have to look and see which of these left rules you can justify. And you can justify both of them, and that means, yeah, you should be able to prove that, okay? And justify them because even if you had both of them, you still have cut elimination. But if you remove one of them, you still have cut elimination. That doesn't change. But now suddenly you can no longer prove that. Your system then has become incomplete. So another way of saying we should be able to prove that is with these rules, the, the cut elimination property for the logic still holds, okay? Which means that these left rules are justified with respect to this definition of the connective by the right rule. So 
Yeah, so. Right, so that's another way to express this. When we have the right rule, we put some information into this proof. And then the two left rules, if you have both of them, guarantees that the information comes back out. Um, if you forget one of them, you cannot extract all the information that you put into a proof, only part of it, and that, make, that makes the system incomplete. Yeah? yeah? Um, well, in the system, we don't really have a weakening property because you, you have exactly one proposition on each side. So that's a whole other story. If I go into that, then I will exhaust this lecture. It's a good question, but it's actually a little bit going too far. So I have to put that off. Yeah. Uh, So, no weakening basically just says you don't have to use all your assumptions in a proof. And here you actually have to use all your assumptions. Okay. So, it's a different kind of proof when you have some assumption that you don't have to use. So, um, this kind of system is what we call linear in proof theory, and every assumption must be used exactly once in a proof, essentially. Um, and so, when you introduce weakening, then we get systems called affine, in which all assumptions have to be used at most once. But uh, this system here is very strongly linear. So weakening doesn't really fit very well into the picture at this point. So at a later point, in, not in this lecture, but um, maybe in one of the next few days, we'll get to systems that are more complicated where you can ask questions about weakening. And again, because we have multiple assumptions, so suddenly it begins to make sense not to use all of your assumptions here because we always want exactly one thing on the left. We can't really weaken it away. It's going to stay there. Okay, so that little aside, uh, let me move on to, to talking about the concurrent interpretation of these things, okay? Um, okay, I, I guess I could have left that up. Okay, let me start fresh. Okay, so the idea which underlies a lot of this connection between logic and computation is that, um, is over here. So on the logic side, and here we have the computation side. On the logic side, a proposition of the logic corresponds to a type, and that's because a proposition corresponds on this to a program. And then the next step analogy is that here, proof reduction, and that corresponds on the computation side to computation. Um, so it actually turns out to be a very strong analogy, which is known as the Curry-Howard correspondence between certain types of logics and certain types of programming languages. The one that we're most familiar with is the idea that proofs in natural deduction of intuitive logic correspond to functional computation of functional programming language. Okay, so I'm not gonna talk about that at all, okay? There's other analogies. For example, it's called Curry-Howard because the 1934, I think, anticipated this, that um, this logic here, which you called combinatory logic, corresponds to a form of computation on this side, okay? Um, and so it actually has a pretty long history, even though it wasn't brought out very clearly at the time, okay? So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna instantiate this picture, but for this notion of singleton logic, with just one assumption, one conclusion, okay? And we see what notion of type we get, what kind of programs we get, what kind of computation we get out of that, okay? So what we start with is on the logic side, we said A entails B, okay? And now we're just gonna say that somehow from the derivation we extract a program, okay? And so it looks like this, A 
a program P has type B. Okay, so it looks a little asymmetric because all the generalization of it are asymmetric, but it's just a, a matter of notation. So this is a program which will turn out to be a concurrent program. And these two here are the types that govern its communication with another process which sits to the left or another process which sits to the left, as uh, to the right. So I, call this, I should call this a process. Okay, so this is um, a type uh, describing or prescribing communication. And the same thing here. Type prescribes the communication, okay? So any of these processes will communicate to two other processes, one being to the left and one being to the right. Unless it's the endpoint, in which case, of course, it cannot communicate because there's nothing sitting there, okay? So now we need to figure out what the various things in the logic actually mean with respect to this interpretation of uh, the proofs as programs. What do they mean as processes? What kind of communication is, uh, behavior is prescribed? And how can we actually write programs now and actually write interesting uh, programs that communicate. So, let's see. Um, let's start with cut because cut is actually one of the most interesting things. So we say A proves B and from B um, we can prove C and then at, in the conclusion we have A and tails C. Okay, so I should probably dynamically switch colors maybe. Okay. So now what I want to say is that there's some process P here, okay, which has this interface of type A to the left, interface of type B to the right. To the right of that, there's another process Q, which has interface of B here and C here. And now the process put these two together is the parallel composition of P with Q, okay? So if you know about the pi calculus, this is different because in the pi calculus, this here is like symmetric and things like that. But no, it's not symmetric because these have to be next to each other. Okay, I just didn't bother inventing a new notation for that. Okay, so putting them next to each other, say they can communicate. And if you want to make it explicit, we can put the type B here. That just tracks um, what the type of this channel along which P and Q communicate is, because that will describe on how they send and receive messages to each other. Okay. Uh, okay, so cut, if I might make some correspondence somewhere, um, maybe here. So cut is parallel composition. Um, and uh, okay, so let's next think about what, what does the identity mean? Okay, so we have A proves A, okay, and that's the identity. Um, okay, so the idea for this particular process is we just essentially behave like the identity, like the name says, okay? If a message comes from the left here, then it should go out here. If a message comes out here, it should go out here because we're not doing anything. We're behaving like an identity, just forward messages around. Okay, and so we'll just write it like this with a, with a little double arrow, okay? Um, just plugging the two things together, but not really doing anything, behaving like the identity on messages. Uh, or I should have switched colors here, because this is actually a process term. Okay, so let's see. Um, what the computation and behavior of these things should be given what we did when we did cut elimination. Because I said that proof reduction should somehow correspond to computation. So now we need to analyze our proof of cut elimination again and try to see um, what kind of reduction that actually corresponds to on these processes, okay? Um, so identity, maybe we should call it forwarding. Okay, so now do you remember when we had a cut 
between um, A proves A and A proves C because this was the identity. This one we didn't care about. And then we got out um, proof of A proves C, okay? Um, how did we eliminate this cut? We just replaced it by E, right? So that just... Okay, I'll try. So E is that particular proof that we come from here that A entails C. Okay, so that was our case in the cut elimination proof, right? The identity somehow is the inverse of cut, so if we cut with the identity, that cut just disappears. This one cancels that one, and we just get this proof here on the right, okay? Now, if we annotate this with proof terms, okay, this is what it'll look like. This one here is the left-right, which is put in parallel with this one here, which let me call this process P, which would be the one that sits in here, okay? And the process that sit, okay, this is not uh, writing it larger, okay. Okay, so there's a P here. And then the term that fits in here is going to be the forwarding term in parallel with P, right? That's what's gonna be here. And then after I do the reduction, what do I get? Well, I get this one here, which is just P, okay? So this forwarding composed with P just reduces to um, to just P. So that's our rule of computation we get from that. Yeah? Wait, so when you do like the cut A and L, B and B and L, C, yeah. you have these two processes, P and Q, right? Mm -hmm. are, they, are, are they asynchronously communicating with each other? Um, well, I said it's parallel, but, but I'm a bit, it seems like this is like a, a, async communication. Uh, Ask the question again once we come to, um, to various connectives. Because there's different models of com about how the communication actually proceeds. Um, anticipate what's going to happen here that it looks synchronous, just like a synchronous pi calculus. Both sides have to make a step at the same time. But we'll see why that is in a minute, okay? Um, but this reduction that we had in the proof of cut elimination actually becomes this reduction of processes. Make sense? Now, if the identity is on the right-hand side, then it looks like this. We have a P in parallel with the forwarding, and then it just reduces to P. So it doesn't matter which side this is on. Okay, it always reduces to P, okay? And so these reductions are just extracted from um, the proof. We don't have to really do any work in order to figure out what should happen, okay? And let's think about the types now, okay? So this is always something we have to do, but if you have a process, it has an interface on the right and an interface on the left. So this process here has an interface on the left, which is A, and it has an interface on the right, which is C, and internally this interface is typed at A, right, because this cut here is at type A. And we wanna make sure whenever we do this reduction that the interface does not change, right, the interface for this process on both sides should be the same. While the left interface of P is A, okay, because that's the type of P on the left, and the right type of C is, the right interface is C, so they're still the same. So here and here the interface hasn't changed, and so if this is plugged into a bigger configuration of parallel processes, it's perfectly okay because we don't change the type of the interface, which would be a problem, right? And similarly here, right, that's the same thing. So this is gonna be A, Maybe this is going to be B, and this is going to be B, and then afterwards it's still going to be A and B, okay? So the interface types don't change. So we have to check this for all of our reduction, make sure that the interface types of the outside don't change because this is plugged into more processes which are cut into here and cut into here, and we don't want to compromise those connections. Okay, so those are two rules that's good to have to start with. Um, so I'm going to write them over here. Um, so, um, P in parallel with forwarding reduces to P, and similarly, forwarding parallel with P also goes to P. Why do, why do we need to check the types? Uh, Doesn't does the sort of logical terms match 
Yeah, so a property of the system we want to prove is that if you make a reduction computationally, some, something takes place, that the interface type don't change. So I'm just walking you through the proof. Right. Okay. But isn't that demonstrated by your formula above? Yes. Yeah, so this would be part of the proof. You'd see this was A and C, but it's easier if I just write it in, it's, you can kind of more easily check that. So, yeah. Yeah? So, mm -hmm. Right, I'm defining a new relation, which is a reduction relation on my programs. And there are the two rules which are summarized over there. And this little calculation here shows that they are good rules in the sense that at least they don't change the outside interface. And um, they also justify the name identity in another way than before. Identity before said A on the left, A on the right. And here means computationally it's the identity in the sense that it terminates and disappears. Okay? We good? Okay, so now it becomes interesting to see what the logical connectors that we have, of which we have actually just two, what they actually mean in terms of message passing between two processes, right? And the way we analyze that is we again look at the proof reductions. So let me uh, remind you of the reductions. And maybe I can be a little bit more clever in writing this so I have room to write in the proof terms. Okay, so we had one reduction like this. Um, a proves B plus C because A proves B. This was the plus left one rule. And then over here we had B plus C proves D. Um, and that's because B proves D and C proves D and with the plus left. So this was the plus right. Okay, and then we had the cut. And the cut was, it was at type B plus C. And our conclusion was that A should prove D. Um, okay, so we had a reduction for this. Um, anybody remember how this reduction worked? So we build a new cut. Okay. What type is the new cut at? B. And which things did it cut? This one here with this one here, okay? So it cuts A, B with B, D. And so, and fortunately we get the same conclusion, but now with a different proof. Okay, so now let's see what happens when I say what are the process terms that have to, have to fit in here. In order to do that, I kind of have to figure out what process terms I actually want to, I mean, I have to design my language describing these. Okay. So let's start over here. When we said we're depend on a conjunction, a disjunction on the left, uh, we said we do a proof by cases because we don't know if B or C is going to be true, so we have to be ready in each case to respond, right? Okay. So I'm going to call this case. So that's my new constructor here. Um, and it turns out it's convenient to actually say that it's a case for something that happens on the left. So I'm going to say case left. Okay. And there's going to be two possibilities that this proof that I'm cut with either is going to be the first or the second uh, right rule for plus. So I'm going to have two possibilities. Either it's the first one or it's the second one. And then in each case I get D. Okay. 
Okay, so what is that here? Well, this is a process, actually, I'm going to call this Q. And this is a process R. So this process term says if I receive pi 1 from the left, I'm going to continue as Q. If I receive pi 2 from the left, then I'm going to continue as R. Okay? And over here, if this is P, and this term is going to send to the right um, uh, pi 1 because it's the first projection. So I send to the right the label pi 1, and then I continue as P. Okay, so that's what I'm going to write this as. Okay. So then down here, it's simply parallel composition. So I have a parallel composition of a process that sends pi 1 to the right and continues as P in parallel with a case which looks to the left. If I see pi 1, I continue as Q. And if I see pi 2, I continue as R. Okay. Now what happens down here? Okay. So this is going to be P. And this is going to be Q. And what should be the term down here for D? It's, yeah, it's P. We don't even have to look above the line here, right? It's just a cut. So it should be the parallel composition of P with Q. Okay? Okay, so does that actually make sense, what we're, what we're doing here? Um, okay. So we have two processes next to each other, which are running in parallel. This one sends a label pi 1 to the right. And this one does a case on which label it receives. It receives pi 1 and continues at Q. So this part continues as Q. And this part sends a label and then continues as P. Okay. So if I write the rule over here, um, it would look like this. If I have R dot P1 followed by P in parallel with case left of pi 1 continue as Q, 2 continue as R, uh, then this should reduce to P in parallel with Q. Okay. And even without writing the proof thing, you can probably, if I send the second projection here to the right and continue as P, and I put that together with the case left of pi 1 arrow Q or pi 2 arrow R, then I continue as P in parallel with, oops, with R because this, this process over here selected the right branch. Okay. Okay, so what's happening here is that the rules for plus, of which I have two, they send a message, okay? And depending on whether um, I proved just B or I proved C, it's going to send pi 1 or pi 2. And the proof here that does a proof by cases expects that information, and based on the information that it gets, it either continues as Q or continues as R. Okay. Does that, that make sense? Yep. Um, well, the, the way we came up with all of this originally was by trying to give a type system for the body calculus, which has concurrency already built in. So we didn't actually look around for anything sequential. Okay. Um, So I don't know how to actually, there is a sequentiality going on here, right? Because this does two things sequentially. First send this behave like that, and this one receives and then continues there. So sequentiality is built into, but the communication itself um, is not really sequential. This one doesn't have to happen before this or vice versa. They happen synchronously. So that's your question back there about 
is it synchronous or asynchronous? It's synchronous because both sides of the communication step forward together. Right? This becomes P and this becomes Q. Yeah? So is this like a parallel communication or so these processes have sequentiality built into it, and that sequentiality depends on the proof. Because the rules and the proof, if you go up, they're done in sequence. First I do this, then that, then that. So these are sequential, okay? But then the, the communication among the processes, that's uh, a concurrent communication. So maybe you're right that these processes are sequential because they do things in a certain order, um, but the cut puts them together concurrently. In, in parallel. Other questions? Yeah? Just an additional question. The R I one continued by P. Is that R the same R as the process term? Uh, no. This is I thought now I just don't know what it otherwise it means. So this means to the right, send to the right. And this means receive from the left. So if I'd been smart, I would have called this Q1 and this Q2, and then there wouldn't have been a problem. Okay. So, yeah. that, so just because the notational artifacts, just because the turnstile is pointing to the right, yeah. does not necessarily mean that information always flows from left to right. Oh no, 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 of course not. Yeah. <laughs> so actually we'll come we'll come to that next, but I wanted to make sure that this was understood. There was another question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so if we're staying in this pure thing here, the way I've described it, um, it would become a sequential program, except it might have some cuts. No, all the cuts would be gone, that's right. Yep, so you would just have a sequence of actions. Yeah, That's not how we actually execute, um, but that's, I'll come to that. But yes, cut elimination, if I stay in this pure logic, implies that I can start with an arbitrary program and I end up with one that just has a sequence of actions, yeah? Yeah. So it, this is never materialized. Uh, well, it is materialized somewhere here. But in this particular case, if you compose it with this particular process, it's not used. If you happen to have composed it with something else, it is then used. It's like if you write a functional program with a case expression, any particular time it's applied, only one branch is selected. And here, only one branch will be selected and not the other one. So the other one is going to be ignored. Um, we shall probably briefly talk about the types, but I think you can see from the picture already that the types are going to work out. The interface type here is going to be what we'll call it B plus C. The interface to the left is A and to the right it's D. It stays A and D, and what's the interface type here? B, right. Okay, so we went from an interface at type B plus C to an interface at type B. Okay. Um, but both sides agree on that. So that means we have um, a preservation of typing, right, which is uh, the typical thing you prove in programming languages. The interface types are preserved. Internally, the types could change. In fact, if they internally don't change, then you don't really have much computation going on, right? But here, yeah, internally they can change. Okay, so now the information just flows in one direction, so it looks at, let's look at the other direction. And you probably can guess what connective is relevant for the other direction. Well, since we only have one other connective left, okay. Not much guesswork is involved. So I'm gonna go over this a little faster because I want to actually write some programs. Um, but if I have um, A proves B with C, uh, oh. I do need some more room here. And then A proves, while I write this down, you might think, consider what you would actually expect for this to be. Okay, I have C. 
And then I have the first and the second left rule, A with B proves C because A proves C, and A with B proves C because B proves C, okay? So what kind of communication, oh no, I call these, okay. Let me fix this. I want these letters to match up so it's easier to see what's going on. That's B with C. Um, and this is going to be D. And this is B with C. This is going to be C and that's going to be D. Okay, so what kind of communication pattern would we expect here between these kind of proofs? So if you put the cut between the with right and either of these two with left rules, maybe with this one, who should be sending information, who is receiving it? The process on the left or the The one on the right is, is doing sending or receiving? It should send because it has to be one of these two. So it either says, okay, I picked out B or we picked out C. So in the proof on the right, we have some information about which part is selected. And this one here receives, right? Receives either information, oh, okay, well, B was selected, then you have to continue like that. Or C was selected, and then you have to continue like that. Make sense? So now the communication goes in the other direction. The process on the right sends and the process on the left receives. Okay? Um, just because of the way the rules work. Okay? So let's do this. So this is going to be a process. Um, okay. Uh, Q. And it's going to send to the left. pi 1 and continuous Q. Okay? That make sense? We're sending pi 1 because we selected the first part, the B from here. And then this one here, um, okay, so let's also call this Q. And it sends pi 2 to the left, L dot pi 2, and continues as Q. Okay? And then this here is going to be a case but we do a case not over what we receive from the left we had, but we have to receive it from the right. If we receive pi 1, or we And here we're going to have, um, okay, p1, and here we're going to have p2. And this is going to be p1, and this is going to be p2. And the interaction then says, if I can write it down over here, okay. If I have a case right, and if I go pi 1, I continue as p1. And if I see pi 2, I'm going to continue as p2. Okay, And this is put in parallel with um, l dot pi 1 followed by q. Then this reduces 2. Okay. So this process here, because it receives pi 1, continues as p1. Um, and this continues as q. And the second one is simple, just the other case. If I see pi 1 goes to p1, or pi 2 goes to p2 in parallel with, I send to the left the label pi 2, continue as q. Then I reduce this to p2 in parallel with q. Okay? So really, we just have sending a label pi 1 or pi 2, either to the left or to the right, and we have a case either on the left or on the right. Make sense? Okay. And that's all we have in this logic. Okay? Um, and so computationally, we either disappear because we're forwarding, um, which means termination, um, or we proceed by sending one of these labels to the left or to the right. 
So that's what we can communicate between the two processes. Okay, so um, the question is, can we actually use, use this to write some interesting uh, programs, okay? And the answer is no, okay? <laughs> okay. So the problem is, but fortunately, Alexandra is here to save us, okay? Um, the problem is that any program in this very small language will terminate in very few steps, okay? Because cut elimination generally terminates in very few steps, okay? So there's, you can write some programs, but they don't actually mean very much, okay? If you want to do interesting programs, you need one more idea, okay, to add to all of this. And this is, a, this is the idea of um, what we call a recursive type, okay? So, or you can think of these as infinite propositions, okay? So, for example, um, you might want to say something like um, a stream of bits B0 and B1, okay? So you say something like a bit stream is an internal choice. Oh, yeah, I should, by, by the way, say that the names for these connectives, um, the plus means an internal choice. And it's an internal choice because we think of being the right-hand side because that's what we have to provide. And this is something we assume, so the environment will provide it to us. So it's an internal choice in, that, in the sense that when we prove this, we can decide whether you use the, right rule, the first right rule or the second right rule. And the width is called the external choice because you're waiting here for the thing that you cut with on the right-hand side to tell you uh, how to proceed, okay? So they're called internal and external choice, okay? So bits you can think of being um, an internal choice between either sending a label pi one or sending a label pi two, and then proceed again like a stream of bits, okay? So what that stream actually looks like, if you, um, is uh, you will send across one of these interfaces, if it has this type, you have to send a pi one or a pi two, and then you have to, again, behave like a bit stream. So again, you have to send a pi one or a pi two, and after that, again, you have to send because it circles back around, okay? So the communication pattern is you just have to send a stream of bits. And similarly, if this is on the left-hand side, then you have to receive a stream of bits, okay? Um, so this is sometimes called uh, an infinite proposition, or you can also think from the type perspective as a recursive type. And if you know something about, we, about programming languages, it's an equi-recursive type because we write equals here. So this is equal to that rather than iso-recursive type where we say the two things are isomorphic. Um, that's just sort of a small detail. Okay, so now with this definition, we can now write some slightly interesting programs. For example, we could write a program that receives a stream of bits, flips the bit, and outputs them to the right, okay? So what would that program look like? Let's call it flip. On the left, it has a bit stream. On the right interface is also a bit stream, okay? So both interfaces are the same. Both interfaces at the top level or an external choice. Yep? Sorry, should one of the bits on the right hand side just be a bit? No? No? Nope. Should What's it? the base case of the recursive type? Um, there isn't one. Ice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but we know it's perfectly okay because an infinite stream of bits, you just have seen infinite words in the previous lecture, so you should be completely comfortable with that by now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, they do, because the elements are B, pi 0 and pi 1, right? Pi 0 and pi 1, or pi 1 and pi 2, as I call them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. okay, if we want to prove properties of these programs, okay, we have to use pi simulations, right? Surprise. <laughs> because they, they work with infinite streams of bits, okay? All right, so how would we, how would we define flip? How do we define flip? So if you look at this type, right, 
can we output something on the right hand side? No, we cannot because we have to first read a bit and then output the opposite of it on the other side. So it has to start with case, case left or case right? Case left, okay? So it's a case left. And there's two cases. We could receive a pi 1 or we could receive a pi 2. Okay? Now, if we receive a pi 1, what do we do? We send pi 2 to the right. And then we continue as flip. Okay? And if we see a pi 2, We send pi 1 to the right, and then we call ourselves recursively. Okay, the program makes sense? Yeah? Can we take the flip out of the case? No, there isn't any way to say, do this. Okay, we don't have a general sequential composition. We can only do something and then continue immediately. Yep, so we can't factor that out. Yep? Um, okay, so it can't be a case right because this is a plus and therefore we cannot receive anything if you look at the rules. Um, the plus will receive from the, will send to the right. So we cannot receive from the right just by typing. Now, we could have another type. Um, uh, I don't know, let's, okay, left streams, and then external choice between left bits like that, okay? And then you could have another flip program, let's call it flop, okay, which would take one of these and produce one of these. And what would that program have to do? Well, it would have to receive the pi 1 and pi 2 from the right and send it to the left. Okay, So this plus here encodes a particular protocol that says you have to send on the right and you have to receive on the left. And this type here is the opposite protocol you receive on the right and you send on the left. So the type tells you what to do. Other questions? Be okay with flip and flop? You can write flop, right? Yeah? Hmm? Ah, merge, excellent, very good question, we can't. Because we would have to have two streams on the left and then one on the right, but we can't have two merge. Okay, sorry, that'll be the next lecture. Then we can write merge, okay, but not right now. Okay, so what kind of things can we actually write here? If you forget about the width and we just look at the plus. Okay, so let's try to do something slightly more interesting, okay? So we really want to explore what we can do with this thing. Um, let's try to write something that, if you have a run of zeros, you compress them all into just one. Or actually, this pi one and pi two. If you have a run of pi ones, compress it to one, okay? So, uh, uh, so we have a bit stream here, and we want to say compress. Uh, pi 1, and we have a bit stream over here. Okay, so this, if you want to compress runs of pi 1, how do we do that? Okay, well, the start is pretty easy, right? The first part of this you can write pretty easily because can we output anything? No. The interface tells us we have to either read something from here or output to here, right? We can't output anything, so we should input something, right? So we do a case left. And there's two possibilities. We get a pi 1 or we get a pi 2. All right. What do we do if we get a pi 1? We want to read again. Okay. Um, you output 1 pi 1, right? You're supposed to output 1. Okay. R dot pi 1. 
Okay, but we can't call ourselves recursively because if we see the next pi one, we'll output that again. So we haven't done any compression. But what if we see a pi two? So we do out pi two, we output pi two, and then we can call ourselves recursively. We can call compress with one, right? Because that's okay, because for, for pi two, we just pass them through. But for pi one, we can't call ourselves recursively because we need to make sure, what do we need to make sure? We only output one. We only output the one, and the next one is a pi one, we ignore it. The next one is a pi one, we ignore it, and so on, right? So as the next, so we have to call some other one, let's call it ignore ones, okay? And let's write that. So what's the type of ignore one? Well, it also takes a bit stream. We ignore all the ones in it, and we create a bit stream. And how does ignore one work? So ignore one, okay? So again, the type says we either have to output something or we have to input something. So we do a case, we input something, case left. If we see pi one, what do we do? We recurse because we have to ignore it. So we don't output anything. We just call ourselves recursively. And if we see if pi two, right, we emit a pi two. And then we go back to comp one. Okay. The program makes sense? Yeah? Well, all the constructs in the language, there's like six constructs in the language, right? Um, forward, cut, and two case and two cent constructs. No. I'm thinking maybe we can use the process looking at the pi and we can go into the same extra signal. But we don't have any real memory. Yeah. Okay. So in fact, we don't have memory. What does that suggest about the expressive power of, of this language? Yeah, but even more precisely, we don't have memory. Finite automaton. Finite automaton, right? So in fact, the expressive power of this language, if you only have plus, okay, is essentially the things you can write are finite state transducers. Okay, that's it. And the interesting part is also the opposite. Any cut-free proof that you can write you can read off what the finite state transducer that it implements actually is. So what we actually have in this language, if we only do plus, we don't do with, a correspondence between um, these propositions, so we only have plus, and we have these infinite, these recursively defined propositions, um, and the programs are finite state transducers, okay? Um, the computation is just a computation of an automata, except that things can happen in parallel, okay? So what are main things can happen in parallel? Um, so for example, could we write, okay? Uh, okay, uh, I'll put it here. Let's say I wanted to ignore zeros, okay? Instead of, no, ignore twos instead of, this is pi one and pi two, I always get my base case mixed up. Okay, I wanna ignore pi twos. So one possibility is to just copy this program and um, you know put this case down here, et cetera, right? I could do that. But what else could I do? Yeah, so I could write a program ignore two which is flip composed with ignore one composed with flip, right? 
So there's a stream of bits coming through. I replace one by zero, so I mean na uh, uh, twos by ones. All the ones, I mean runs of ignore, sorry. That would be actually not the program I had in mind. I want to say compress. Okay, so I compress runs of ones here and then I flip it back to twos. Okay, and now I have two things composed in parallel, so potentially more than one thing can happen if I have these long chains of processes that actually run. Okay, so I can take these finite state transducers and compose them into longer chains of things. Um, why did I write ignore here? Sorry, I meant compress twos. I don't need to write a new ignore program because this will call ignore one and that's what I really wanted, okay. Sorry about that bug in the program. Um, so if this is my transition relation I can apply to any part in, in, the, uh, in the configuration of these things that are composed in parallel, I can achieve that concurrency. Now, as some pointed out, there is some, um, uh, because communication is synchronous, I don't necessarily have as much um, concurrency as I might want because maybe this process is occupied reading from here and I won't be able to actually like send to here until it's finished here, right? So what I really like to get even more concurrency is communication to be asynchronous, which means that when I send, I don't wait for the recipient, I just move on, okay? Um, but it turns out you can actually implement in this language, okay, a um, asynchronous sending of a message. It's actually possible in, the, in this very small language that we have, you can actually already implement asynchronous message send, okay? So I'll let that percolate for a second. Um, so, how would I do that? So here, in this piece of code, okay, I send pi one to the right, and then if it's received, then I continue call ignore one, right? So now I want to write a program where I call ignore one, basically, and I don't wait for this to be received. How is that possible? Anybody see how to do that? Yeah? Yeah, you want to create a queue of some kind. When the right, is right, the question is how do you create the queue? Yeah, that's what you want to do. You want to create a queue. But the question is how do you do this in this absolutely minimal, totally small language? We only have plus. You don't even need width for that. Just plus. Just one connective, okay? All, of the, all what we're doing today is programming with one connective. How would we do this, yeah? You like to uh, send to the right pi one followed by identity parallel composition with the core one? Yeah, okay, you got it. So the comp one is a case left. So there we have to wait because it's an input. We can't proceed until we have the input. If we see pi one, what we do is we spawn a new process, okay? And the new process sends pi one to the right and when it's received, oh, it just forwards. So this one then terminates and gets out of the way, okay? And on the left of that we call ignore one immediately, okay? So it'll spawn this thing here, which is actually a process, but really acts as a message. It says receive one pi one, and then we terminate as soon as it's received. But because this is a parallel composition, this will kind of already start and continue. And similarly, if we see pi two, how do we rewrite the second line? We call comp one recursively immediately in parallel with sending pi two to the right and forwarding, okay? So really, you can already encode asynchronous communication, even though the rules themselves are synchronous. Because we have forwarding, we can co-opt that, we can use that as a programming technique in order to implement asynchronous communication if you want more parallelism in our programs. Okay, does that piece of code make sense? 
So see what happens when this is received, the process it receives, it selects the first branch, which is then composed with the identity, because that's a continuation. And then the rule that deletes the identity will kick in, okay? And this thing disappears entirely. And meanwhile, this could have already worked in between, yeah? Yeah. Well, there is some sequentiality. Whenever we receive, we have to wait till we get what we receive. And after that, we proceed with, two th with the message and our continuation in parallel. But there's no way where you sort of receive three things and then send them. Like it's still there. You receive one, send one. Oh, yeah. So can we receive one, send two? Well, that's not a problem, right? because we could spawn two processes here, okay? So yeah, we can, we can do something more complicated there, yeah. So if we wanted to send two copies of pi one, then what we would do here is we send pi one, then another pi one, and then we forward. That would be one way to do it. Another way to do it would be another parallel composition here with another r dot pi one. Okay, and that would be sending two pi ones. So you can, you can do a lot of that kind of uh, low-level hacking to get these things have more concurrency. Okay, all right. Let's write a little more code since um, I have a few minutes left. Um, let's see what do I want to do next. Um, so let's try to do a. How would you do a finite state automata? So something that, um, let's see, it accepts any stream when you see pi one, pi two, pi one, pi two, and so on. Um, actually, that would be difficult because the stream would never finish, right? So, um, yeah, I don't really want to get into infinite automata. So <laughs> it would be nice if you could get this thing to finish at some point. So how can we get things finite? Okay, so we have a finite uh, bit stream. Okay. Fits, finite bits. Okay, so what I'd like to say is that it either gives you pi one or it gives you pi two or it gives you something of some new type alpha. So this is kind of a polymorphic definition. Um, and it gives you a pi three, if you will, and then continues as alpha, okay? So that actually doesn't quite work. So what we do is we generalize these binary constructs. Instead of having just two choices, pi one and pi two, to have three, four, five, n constructs. So what we do is we say, um, for example, a plus b is actually some kind of now defined as an internal choice between send pi one and then behave like A, or send pi two and then behave like B. Okay, so the general case of that is we have an internal choice where we have labels and we have a separate continuation for each label from some finite set of labels, okay? And then I would start define this as saying that it's an internal choice between either send pi one, and then more bits come, or I send pi two, and then more bits come, or I'm done with that, and then I say, okay, I'll send a particular end, let's say, let's call it E, and then I send something of type alpha, okay? And so this is all. So E de designates here the end of the sequence of bits that are coming in, okay? Um, so now, what, why did I, oh, because I wanted to write an automata that accepts, okay? Um, actually, let's make it, yeah, okay, so I want alternating bits. I want to recognize alternating bits, okay? So alt, okay, so we have oops, fits on the left, and we have uh, fits on the left and fits on the right. Um, no, I don't want to have fits on the right. If I want to indicate if I accept something or not, 
I need a binary choice because I'm not actually producing a stream, just a single thing. Okay. So on the right-hand side, I'm going to give an internal choice between either accept and then I continue to type alpha or reject and then I continue to type alpha. Okay. All right. Can I write alt? Okay. So I have an internal choice here, but I don't really know yet whether to accept or reject. Um, so I have to do a case on the left. And I could get a pi 1, or I could get a pi 2, or I could get an end of stream indicator. Okay. Now, if I get a pi 1, what should I do? So because I want pi 1 followed by pi 2, followed by pi 1, followed by pi 2, I have to call another function, another process that waits for pi 2 first, right? So I called some new thing. Um, maybe I should, instead of alt, I should call these even. Um, call this even. And I call this odd. But no output. And odd does a case left if it's pi 1, if it's pi 2, or if it's even. OK. Now, pi, if I see a pi 2, what do I do? I want to reject because it started with a pi 2 and not a pi 1. OK. So I should be able to say um, r.reject. But then I'm not really sure what to do. Let's fix that in a second. If I get the end of my bits, then what do I do? I'm going to call accept. And what do I do after accept? So after I receive E, the continuation type is alpha. So the type on the left now is alpha. Okay. After I send accept, um, here is also of type alpha, so I can just terminate by forwarding between the two. Okay. So I've done my work, I've sent out accept, and I can forward, terminate by doing that. Now in here, if I see a pi 1, what do I do? I want to reject, right? And then I'm not sure what to do. If I see a pi 2, I call even, right? Because seen after uh, pi 1, I've seen a pi 2, so I'm still in sync. If I see E, what do I want to do? I want to reject, right? Um, actually, probably, well, now we have to figure out what we want if it finishes without a pi 2. Maybe accept. OK, so I want to accept because they were all alternating. And then I forward. OK. So I'm not quite done with this program because I can't forward here. Because when I receive a pi 2, the continuation on the input stream is still going to be a stream of bits. OK? A finite stream of bits, potentially. So what I have to do here is I have to call some process consume that consumes all the input bits and then rejects. OK? But I can't stop here. OK? And the type will tell me that. If you type this into our interpreter, It'll, it, and you try to forward here, it says forwarding is illegal because the type on the left, which is after pi 2 is still fits, doesn't match the type on the right, which is alpha. Okay. So we need another thing called consume. What is the type of consume? What's its left interface? Okay, it takes potentially finite stream of bits. And what's on the right interface? Alpha, because um, I've sent the reject already. And how do I define consume? OK, well, we do a case on the left. And there's three possibility. It could be a pi 1, a pi 2, or an n. If I see a pi 1, 
I call myself recursively to consume. If I see a pi 2, consume. And if I finally see an end of stream, then I can forward, right? Because after the E, this has type alpha. The right-hand side has type alpha. So now I can say, OK, I can forward at that point. OK. So now the interesting property of all of this is that uh, if you look at these things and you actually, these programs and they're cut free, um, then it has a type like this. You can construct from that a finite automata. Okay? And if you find that automata, you can implement it by using this technique. So it can go both ways. And the more general type that we had before, um, that gives you these uh, finite state transducers. Okay. Um, and it's finite because you don't have any place, any memory. You, there's no way you can stash something away and then um, use that. Now it turns out if you also add width, then um, you can actually recover the computational power of Turing machines. So we'll, I'll, I'll do that in the next lecture. So you just have to add one more thing, and then it explodes. Yeah? Oh, OK. Um, OK, are there questions on this? Yeah? You mean here? Yes, yeah, so it does reject that. Yeah, it calls, sends reject. Yeah, so at this point, um, no, so at this point, the type that I have to satisfy is exactly that type. I still have fits on the left, and I have alpha on the right, because I send the reject message, so the continuation is type alpha. So what I do is I call consume at this point. And it has the right type. And down here, I also call consume. Yeah. Are you not sending alpha twice, then? Uh, no, I'm never sending alpha. I'm only plugging together the left and the right, and I terminate. So I send reject. But then the alpha never gets sent, because I don't even know what values I should send. I just say, OK, well, this alpha here and this alpha here, I forward between them, and I terminate. Yeah. From finite state machines to Turing machines, that's a jump. Yep. Is there a construct you can add to recover context free grounds? Uh, there's a construct you can add that we conjecture gives you push down automata, but we don't have a proof of that. Um, but um, yeah, so maybe I'll, maybe I'll, I don't know if I have time to bring up that conjecture, but um, we haven't been able to prove that. Yeah. Uh, well, because you need some kind of structural criteria, um, either on the types or on the programs, that guarantee that you're in this middle class. And you don't want it to be a complicated thing, like, oh, it represents a pushdown automata, because that defeats the purpose, right? You want it to do property that has logical meaning. Like here, we say that these things are cut free. OK, that's a very simple logical property. And so we can establish that correspondence. But um, it's very hard to find, or at least it's been difficult for us to find criteria that get you these intermediate terms like PDAs, for example. So we can encode them, of course, because we can also encode Turing machines. But writing in such a way, or identifying criteria that you can only do PDAs, that's the hard part. Yeah? So it seems that only two parties that are communicating Yeah, so no, many parties can communicate, but they all have to be lined up in a row. Uh. <laughs> right? Because like here, there are three things. Right? And then you can compose more things. So there's many, many processes that can all communicate, but only with your immediate neighbors. Right, so if you want to do like a merge, then the singleton logic doesn't work anymore because 
you need to have two processes on the left that you're going to merge into one on the right. So then we need something stronger than singleton logic. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, so you arrange it so that things actually happen on the left. Because you, on the right, you have only one thing. So you're stuck with that. So um, at least I don't know of any way to circumvent that restriction. There's always one thing on the right. There may be many things on the left. Um, but to do it the other way around, I don't know how to do that. Other questions? OK, so just to summarize, what we did is we had our singleton logic with very few connectives. And today, actually, in this, we only use plus. Um, and we interpreted the proofs as programs, as concurrent processes, and the type as prescribing the communication. And then plus means internal choice, which means we send a label to the right. And with is an external choice, we receive or la label from the right. And um, the recipient branches on what the label that it receives in both cases. And then in order to make it actually interesting programs, we needed these kind of infinite or recursively defined propositions or types, depending on which side of the thing you're at. Um, once you have those, then you can write interesting things like finite state transducers or um, uh, finite state automata. Okay. Um, but of course, you also, in general, want to write more complicated programs. So um, either in the next lecture or the lecture the after, we generalize this picture and we allow many things on the left. So we can do, we can then write things like merge. But the theory and also the um, it's conceptually more complicated, right? So here, uh, your, your processes of communicate are always lined up like in one line and you communicate only with your immediate neighbors, okay? Which is a nice thing to have. Um, but it has its limitations. Um, nevertheless, you can program Turing machines. And the reason to give you the preview of that is because the cells on the Turing machine are also lined up in a straight line. It's not like two dimensional, right? So, uh, you know, we were lucky that Turing only had to do it this way. Yeah. A potentially infinite. It's, still, it's always finite chain of processes, but you can always extend it by spawning new ones on each side. Well, the, the recursive type describes not the processes, but it describes the messages that go back and forth. Um, these are the cells. So, okay. All right. I, I'm going over time, so sorry. Yeah.